Emmanuel, and welcome to Good Friday Service here with us today. Um, and in, for the youth group members that are joining us, uh, welcome to the youth kids. Uh, we're glad that you're able to be a part of this reflection uh, and Tenebrae service. Um, Good Friday Tenebrae service. Tenebrae is a candlelight service. In the Latin, it stands for shadows or darkness. And it's a worship to reflect on the death of Jesus Christ for our sins on the cross. Um, tonight's a little bit different because the idea of it is to reflect and to pray. And it's a somber worship that takes very seriously, uh, not only generally thinking about Jesus, but taking seriously the suffering and sacrifice of Jesus um, and how it's meant to stay at the forefront um, of our hearts and minds as we think about Good Friday leading to Easter. Um, so through tonight's service and reflection, we'll be reading through John 18 and 19 in eight different sections. And after each section is read, we'll have a time of reflection and prayer and confession. Um, and after each section is over, we'll blow out one of the candles. Um, there are eight candles representing the eight sections of the text. And at the, after the last reading, we'll be left with no candles lit. And that symbolizes the death and passing of Christ on the cross. Um, as Christians, we say, uh, I've been reflecting on this for the past couple of weeks in preparation for this, but as Christians, we say to each other all the time, Look to the cross, or keep your eyes on the cross. Uh, but we forget what this means. Um, we forget what this means in the sense that the cross is a very gruesome place of suffering, of blood, and of death. If we truly understand what the cross was and what Jesus endured on it, then it would actually be a hard place for us to want to look and to keep our eyes and hearts fixed on that. But it's important to remember. It's important to look to the cross to remember the cost and the price that Jesus paid for our redemption and surrender to the Father and abandonment by the Father out of his love for us. And so as we remember the cross of Jesus Christ, we're not only reminded of his sacrifice, but we remember um, his call for us as those saved by his blood to follow him, to remember him and to obey him as his children. And that in his death, we are not left there, but we are also raised to life in him in faith as he conquers sin and death. But the reality of, uh, of Easter, of Good Friday, that we have to remember is that he did go to the cross to die for our sins. And so this is why we're gathered today on Good Friday, to look at the cross, to remember what this means for us as we die to ourselves in faith and the promise of hope that we have in his gospel and in the grace of God. So the call to worship for tonight comes from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. And this is the word of the Lord. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, we have turned, every one, to his own way. And the Lord was laid on him, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Amen. Emmanuel, would you come to a moment or two to humble yourselves in God's presence and prepare ourselves for worship and prayer? Let's pray.
Amen. The first reading of our tender grace service comes from the book of John, chapter 18, verses 1 through 11. John, chapter 18, verses 1 through 11. This is the word of the Lord. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the book of Brook of Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Amen. When we consider and reflect on these words, we have to understand that you and I, we stand with Judas as those who betray Jesus in the garden. And as we begin this path that Jesus takes in the days leading up to his crucifixion on the cross, it is by our vanity and by our sin that we not only are unfaithful to God, but that we declare war against the righteousness of heaven. And yet, what's astounding even in the beginning of this text is that Jesus meets the guards and the high priest's servant whose ear is cut off with mercy. In the face of all this betrayal, Jesus meets them with grace. In all things, God meets us with grace. So Emmanuel, let's take a few moments to reflect, to confess, and to pray as we consider the path of Jesus to the cross. Let's pray. The second reading of our service tonight comes from John chapter 18, verses 12 through 18. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter following Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, 
standing and warming himself. In Peter's denial of Jesus, we see the mirror of our unfaithfulness and fear. We see the fear in which we choose the ways of the world and our own shame as we live for our own comfort against the cost of discipleship, against standing as Christ calls us as his beloved for the grace of God. So as we consider the first denial of the Apostle Peter, let's come to him in a sense of humility and reflect in in a time of prayer as we continue walking with Jesus to the cross. Let's pray. The third reading comes from John, chapter 18, verses 19 through 27. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Jesus bearing the beating and rejection of humanity from the world and from our own denial of him as Lord and Savior, continues to persevere, knowing full well that with each passing moment, he walks to the cross. And as we remember this, let us turn to prayer and reflection in the time of confession as we continue to walk with him to the very moment of his death. Let's pray. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. 
They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusations do you bring against this man? And they answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have, been, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did, did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. We would rather declare the sin and lies of this world and our own hearts as king then confess in faith that Jesus is truly King and Sovereign Lord over all that is. And yet, Jesus continues to walk towards the cross. Jesus continues to speak the truth. And Jesus continues to stand out of his majesty and bears our burdens as his own. As we continue to consider this, let us continue to pray and reflect on the life and soon the death of Jesus Christ for us. Let us pray. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. 
The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and an Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Crucify him. Crucify him. This is what we cry out. And Christ continues to stand quietly like the pure lamb before the, the slaughter, submitting to becoming helpless, submitting to the will of the Father out of his love for us and in obedience. Beloved, this is total humiliation. This is enduring suffering. It's being beaten and spit on, wearing a crown of thorns made and slammed into his head to make him suffer and to mock him. And this is the weight and cost of our sin laid upon the faultless lamb, the one we call Savior. Would you take some time and remember these words and remember his suffering and sacrifice and take some time to think upon his blood and let's take some time to pray together. Let's pray. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the Place of the Skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, 
This man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scriptures, which say, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. We see Jesus here at the height of suffering and humiliation, nailed to the cross next to common criminals who have no standing to dare to even look at him. And yet Jesus continues to bear, to submit, to honor the Father, to love us, and to endure. And even before he is dead, the moments leading right up to his death, the soldiers divide his earthly belongings as if he is already gone. And still, even now, Jesus cares for his mother, and he cares for his disciple John, and he gives John to be the son to his mother, whom he could no longer be. As we consider and we stand convicted by the love of Christ and the pouring out of his own journey, at the cross, would you humbly consider and reflect what that means for us? And would you pray and take some time to thank God that Jesus took the price, or the cost of our sin upon his own shoulders? Let's take some time and pray together. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you also may believe. 
For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Let's pray. After these things, Joseph, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, he asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had, been, no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. This is the death of Jesus Christ being laid to rest in an empty tomb. And what that means for us at this time is that he has been turned over. He has been turned over to pay for the debt of our sin, of our unfaithfulness, and of our disobedience to Christ, to the Father and to the Spirit. Before we extinguish this last candle and theoretically be Surra ourselves are surrounded to darkness. Would you take a moment and understand what this means and ask God for wisdom and insight? Let's take some time and pray before we close this time of reflection. Let's pray.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we take seriously and we place ourselves in the darkness and the silence of the tomb, for this is where Jesus was. Father, we want to take this time to remember and look upon the gruesome and bloody nature of the cross so that we are reminded of what was done by your grace and mercy for us, your children. Forgive us, Father, for not living in a manner that remembers the price that was paid. Forgive us, Father, for the way that we cheapen grace. Forgive us for being caught up in a world where we continue to deny the lordship of your Son. Father, forgive us for our sins against you. And Holy Spirit, would you help our sins to be very bitter so that the beauty of your grace and the gospel in Jesus Christ would be sweet. And Lord, we eagerly anticipate and look forward to the rising of Christ again on Easter. But as he was in the tomb for three days, help us to remain there with him in faith. That as we die with Christ, that we would remember that in our surrender and obedience to him, that we will also rise with him. And so as we take tonight to reflect, to pray, and to remember, Lord, that in our sadness and in our grieving, that your spirit would not only help us to see the fullness of your love, but it would continue to minister and encourage us as we anticipate in the darkness the bright morning light of Sunday of Easter. Thank you for the cross, and thank you that we are here because of you. And thank you that we can trust in you in all things. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Receive the blessing of God's benediction. May the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. And may the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve others. And may the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your hearts to love others. And in all that you do and wherever you go, may you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the face of Jesus Christ in you. Amen. Amen, Emmanuel. We're just so glad that we were able to do this in terms of worship and reflection together tonight. Uh, I want to encourage you to take tonight and just take some time to continue to write and to pray and to reflect and to think about uh, the death of Christ. Um, and tomorrow, if you're able, uh, please join me and some other people in the church that are uh, committing to fast, maybe for at least one meal or the, the entire day if you're able, um, as Jesus is in the grave, uh, to anticipate and to be eager to look forward to uh, the beauty and the glory of Easter morning. So we look forward to seeing you on Easter Sunday worship at 1030 through Zoom. Um, and go in peace. Have a good night.